Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's all greet one another. Let's start anew from today. And with that, the title today is Transformation is Imperative. So following the election, change is what the people want from both political parties these days. And so the idea is not to just engage in political strife, but to make creative changes for the people's lives and the country's future. However, the political world is still in a frustrating situation. It's to the extent that people say they don't even watch the news anymore because it frustrates them. And so the politicians have been listening to people's voices with deaf ears, and so they're being entirely buried by political interests. And they're completely engrossed in Genesis chapter 3 of being focused on themselves. It's really an, an unfortunate situation. So if you do not change according to the time schedule, you will not just stay in the same position, but you will actually regress, and there will be negative repercussions. And so we have a uh, politician who is in charge of making the policies of this region, and that's a very important role. It's almost like the third most important role. And so I prayed that they'll be able to I really gave a prayer of blessings to them so that they'll be able to enjoy the blessing of being with God as they set up these policies. And so I only asked him of one thing, which was the Anti-Discrimination Act, because I wouldn't even be able to give a service if that law was passed. I won't even be able to say that Jesus is the Christ, the solution to all problems and the only way to meet God, because that will be caught by that specific law. So it's a very unfortunate situation. I really do not understand why people are like that. But right now, um, there's never been another situation like right now where only 30% of the people are really active in supporting a political party. And I don't really know what these politicians are afraid of. And they don't have the courage, it's even like a president, you know, you should have the courage that matches that role and be responsible for any actions that you've taken. But really, it's so frustrating, all of their conversations. And even in the recent election, the politician Han dong said something, and then everyone that, that worked around him, they were all fired. And it was really a moment where we could see that politicians really do not know the heart of the people. So really pray for this nation, because what do we have? We're a nation that's divided into half, and we have this jealousy and envy. I 
And there's no other way to explain how we were able to be so advanced to this point that we are at now, economically as well. There's only one explanation for it, and it's that there are the most amount of churches or crosses in this nation. Even if you look in the region of Gangseo at night, you can see so many lit up cross signs. There's no choice but for God to focus on our nation. I've been across the world. Even England, where they say that they were the origins of Christianity, they don't have any churches. It's all dead. It's just a tourist pathway now. In this entire world, the only church, churches that really stay awake and pray, it's only Korea. And even within that, the representative church is Yewon Church. It's not because we are astounding. There's really nothing in this Kangsa region that we're in. But there's no choice but for God to raise us up to save the 237 nations and 5,000 people groups. Even if I was God, I would look at Yewon Church and see that we're really proclaiming the pure gospel. There's no choice but for me to use Yewon Church and Pastor Chung and Ju. And so this is also true spiritually. The most amazing blessing that the gospel can give us is the blessing of transformation. So the gospel that we have promises transformation and provides the experience of transformation. It's not simply giving us knowledge and information, but it is a message of transformation that can change our life entirely. What was the very first miracle that Jesus performed when he started his public ministry? It was also a miracle of transformation. What is the first thing he did? He was invited to the festival of Ghana, and what, what did he do there? So at the time, they would invite a lot of people to this wedding ceremony, and so he went and he sat down, and what happened was they ran out of wine. And so the owner of the house said, we've run out of wine. And they asked Jesus to solve that problem, even though Jesus was not even the owner of that house. Then what did he say? He said, bring water. And what did he do? He changed that water into the greatest wine. It's a transformation. And it's a qualitative transformation. So the gospel changes us qualitatively. So Apostle Paul states in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He completely changes us into a completely new being a new creation. And the believers who have the gospel are those who have been transformed into new creations. Do not think of anyone else. It is yourself. And it does not end here. Paul emphasizes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him and who is the head into Christ. And Peter also gives this recommendation as he concludes Second Peter. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He tells us to continuously grow. Whether it's Paul or Peter, they tell us that our faith should continuously grow. This year more than last year and next year more than this year. It needs to continuously grow. So simply put, a walk of faith should be a series of changes that lead to spiritual growth. 
a series of changes every single week. So just as a newborn baby grows by nursing on the mother's milk, we must also grow spiritually by feeding on the spiritual words of Christ. The more you listen to the worship, the more you hold on to this word, the more you pray with that word, you will continuously grow with that word. What is this? This is the spiritual normal state. It's not something special. Continuously growing with the word is just the spiritual normal state. That's why transformation is not an option. As the title of today's message suggests, transformation is imperative. Let's all repeat after me. Transformation is imperative. It's not an option or a choice, but it's imperative. And so you must think to yourself, has my prayer changed? Is my stance on devoting to the church, has that changed? So today's passage is a well-known passage as the incident of the Mount of Transfiguration. And theologians consider the Mount of Transfiguration incident to be one of the five major events in Jesus' life, along with his incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and his ascension. And so to that extent, it has an important meaning or significance behind it. So the incident on the Mount of Transfiguration can be said to have partially opened the curtain to reveal the glory that Jesus will enjoy in the future. And furthermore, by showing his disciples this transformation, he motivated them to live a transformed life on earth and walk the path of true disciples who exert spiritual influence. So through this passage, I really hope that all members of Yawan Church will not put their hope in the introductory things of the world and instead look to the glorious future and have a new beginning of living life as a witness of change. And that is the life of expanding the various places of our tents given to us as watchmen with the partisans. So do not just limit the gospel to an informational level and think, okay, I received grace. Don't let it stop there. really receive that word and truly make sure to utilize it at the transformation level. Then your personal life, your family, your work, and every aspect of your life will become a place of great joy. It will not be a house of sadness or a funeral home, but it will be like a festival. A festive house. Everywhere you go will be like a festival. So I bless all members of Yewan Church in the name of the Lord to live such a joy filled walk of faith. The first main point is transformed Jesus. Verses 2 to 3 reads And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. So today's passage takes place six days after Peter declared that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's six days after that confession. And Jesus had 12 disciples, but especially in this passage, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up the high mountain. And so I'm sure Jesus looked at the spiritual state of Peter, James, and John, and especially Peter in these instances. And today's passage does not specify why they went up this high mountain. But if we look at Luke chapter 9, verse 28, we can see that Jesus went up the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, Jesus' appearance was suddenly transformed. And the term transformed is originally metamorphosis in Greek. 
And this term, it does not simply mean a change in outward appearance, but signifies a change in the essential form. And so Jesus changed in this essential form, and it pointed to a mysterious revelation of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. That's what transformation is. And Mark notes that Jesus' clothes became radiant and intensely white, that no one on earth could even bleach them to be that way. And Matthew also mentions that Jesus' face shone like the sun. It shone brightly like the sun. And so simply put, up until this point, the disciples had only seen Jesus dressed in the same flesh and clothes as themselves. But in that moment, they suddenly saw his glorious appearance as he will be in the kingdom of God. And in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, it states that this was Jesus and his original form of God. And so he temp temporarily revealed his glorious form to his disciples. So why did he do this? And this Jesus, who was in this glorious form of God, why did he have to appear before us in this human form? The reason is because of the events described in Genesis chapter 3. Due to the sin of the first man, Adam, which occurred in Genesis chapter 3, all humanity fell into sin and became slaves to Satan and fell into a fate bound to eternal destruction. So our relationship was separated from God and we had to run errands for Satan in order to solve that problem for all humanity. So God himself came down to solve this problem of our sin. So God is a righteous God. He cannot see the sin problem. He has to solve that sin problem. What was that solution he gave? It was himself, to sacrifice himself. And that solution was the atonement on the cross. So in order to take the place of our sinful humans, he needed to clothe himself in the flesh of humans. Jesus is not a human, but he had to come as in that flesh in order to redeem us, in order to converse with us. And so he was not a descendant of the sinful Adam, because a descendant of sinful Adam, the sinful man, he cannot be our savior. And that's why all the other religions, they don't have the answer to save salvation. And so he was conceived by the Holy Spirit as a descendant of a woman and came down to this earth. And furthermore, by becoming the sacrificial offering on the cross as the method of God, he shed his blood. Because through that blood that he shed, he completely resolved all of our sins and curses. And so, although Jesus came to carry out this m mission, he, was, he is originally God and has a glorious form. And so, the transformation on the Mount of Transfiguration was a scene where this divinity of Jesus was fully revealed. And so, it previews the glorious future of resurrection, ascension, and the second coming after the crucifixion. It's almost like a movie trailer. For a brief moment, he showed it to them. And it showed these disciples that he is the Messiah, the Christ who will save humanity. 
And verse 7 also mentions that a cloud symbolizing God's presence overshadowed them on the mount. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is identical to the voice that came from heaven at the start of Jesus' public ministry. And this once again confirms that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, who is to save humanity. So above all, this transformation of Jesus Christ was done to give courage and hope to the disciples. Why? Because the path that the disciples would walk on going forward was a thorny path. So he, they would have to give the gospel and save these souls, but that pathway was one of death. And so in order to give them the strength to be able to overcome that, he showed them this transformation. So whenever Peter and the other disciples faced suffering, hardships, or crisis of death while carrying out their ministry after Jesus' ascension, they would have thought of the glory of this time. And so he was saying, you will become like me, have faith in this. If we look at Acts chapter 12, Peter was imprisoned and faced a crisis of death as he was proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the next day he would be killed. James had already been martyred, and so now it was Peter's turn. So the next day he would be killed. However, Peter calmly slept inside the prison. He slept so deeply to the extent that an angel appeared and struck Peter on the side to wake him up. How could he sleep that deeply and calmly knowing that he would be dead the next day? What was the reason behind it? If we look at the guaranteed future while we live on this earth, we can overcome any hardships. We must be able to see the fact that the glory of Jesus Christ becomes our own glory. And so we must open the eyes of faith to see only Jesus Christ amidst any problem or event. We will have victory if we have that faith. As we live our walk of faith, we encounter various problems and incidents, and at times, a pain that seems unbearable may find us, or we may feel really wronged. In these times, you must not lose hold of the fact that we also have a guaranteed future, just like Jesus showed to us himself. It's a special authority that we have as believers. C.S. Lewis, who was a professor at Oxford University in England, once said in his book, Mere Christianity, Most Christians have become very lethargic in this world because they have stopped thinking about the afterlife. Focus on heaven, then this world will be thrown in for you to gain. So he said, focus on heaven then the things of this world will just be thrown in along with it. The moment we look to the glory of God, the moment we live a life that holds hope in eternal heaven, to those people, they will not be shaken by the introductory things of this world. They will not be discouraged because of materialistic things or honor. And there's no way things like hatred, jealousy, or envy towards someone can arise. And you're really far off if you still have these kind of problems within relationships. That's someone that is not receiving grace. So really, if you have this kind of person that you're uncomfortable with, really reconcile with them today. And that can actually even lead to physical problems in your body and health problems. Just forgive them, reconcile with them. If you do that, you'll forever live as if you're 39 years old. Uh, 
So I bless all Yewan Church believers in the name of the Lord to firmly hold on to the clear message of true hope that Jesus shared with the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration and have the evidence to live a life of the main body. The second main point, a witness of transformation. Verse 4 reads, And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Another astounding thing occurred on the Mount of Transfiguration besides the transformation of Jesus. And it was that Moses and Elijah, two famous figures from the Old Testament, appeared before them and had a conversation with Jesus. So there are numerous figures in the Old Testament, but why were these the two individuals that appeared? The common characteristic of these two individuals was that they were figures who representatively showed that Jesus is the Christ. So Moses represents the law. However, if we look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, it reveals that the law is our guardian guiding us to Jesus. And nobody has received salvation by keeping legalism. So we must realize we are sinners and ultimately discover the truth that the only one who can solve our problem is Jesus Christ alone through the law. Those who do not know the law, they don't even know that they are sinners. And if you go to Japan, the Japanese people, they, their faces look bright. But Koreans, we're always frowning. We always have such a dark expression on our faces. It's very serious. But you go to Japan, that's not the case. They're all very bright. Especially the women there, they have really clear and bright eyes. And the reason for that is because they all have like some kind of shrine at home. They all serve these idols. But they don't know that that is the wrong thing to do. But this law, this legalism allows us to realize and it teaches us that I cannot do it on my own. I am truly a sinner. So we can realize I am a sinner and Jesus Christ is the only one to solve my problem. And the way to receive salvation is to go before Jesus Christ. The way for me to live is for me to accept Jesus as the Christ. And that's the mission that Moses had as he kept these laws. And the core of the prophecies made by the prophets represented by Elijah was the Messiah who was to come. So Messiah who is the Christ. That means the same thing. This Messiah will come. So ultimately, these two figures testify that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. However, Peter, who was unable to discover the spiritual meaning, makes an unexpected statement once again. Verse 5 reads, And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Today's passage depicts only the core concisely, but Luke chapter 9 shows the context of what happened before and after this incident. So they had gone with Jesus to the mountain to pray, and while Jesus prayed, the disciples fell asleep. That's what it says, they all fell asleep. They were asleep, and when they opened their eyes, they were suddenly seeing this strange thing happening. They witnessed this astounding occurrence. So they saw Moses and Elijah, whom they never dreamt of meeting after sleeping, and then they say out of impulse, it is good that we are here. 
implying that they would build a tent for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, so, and they would settle down for good there. And Peter is really an interesting person. And it is very like Peter to say this. However, in this case, we must focus on the expression, it is good that we are here. This expression itself is the decisive phrase that obstructs growth in our walk of faith. It is good that we are here. I'm happy with where I am. Let's just do well on our own. Let's just be happy on our own. Between us. In this age of the two thirds of the nations and multi ethnic people, you're saying, oh, let's just enjoy it between ourselves. That's really an absurd thing to say. There's no such thing as just between ourselves. So staying still is never the nature of the gospel. The gospel is about expansion. The gospel is about moving and striding forward. And those with the gospel must stand as a witness of transformation. You must continuously have transformation and change. If things not working out, you need to change that. And now on the first floor, of our cultural building, we've changed it so that people can come in and they can rest there. We can have Gentiles and non-believers come and stay there so that unbelievers can come into our church and set foot in our church. So at a very fast pace, we've become renewed. Really become a witness of transformation in your life as well, a transformation that happens every single day. So the START 10,000 2025 movement we are currently unfolding serves as a channel to stand as a witness of transformation. So the team of three movement that enlarges the place of the church's tent, the 4,000 bodies movement that enlarges the place of the region's tent, and the 237 healing movement that enlarges the place of the 237 tent, and the flesh and bone movement that enlarges the place of our family's tent. Really focus on that especially as May is Family Month, really keep focus on the ministry that enlarges the place of that tent. And we have a church-wide team dedicated to flesh and bone evangelism, so make good use of them. And I've heard some testimonies from young adults who they all went to find family members together and they witnessed how their parents accepted Jesus Christ and did the acceptance prayer. So it's really astounding that young adults are enjoying these answers. And yet there are people who do not wish to open up or reveal their family members and they just think they're happy where they are. Is that really okay just for you alone to go to heaven? So really get rid of that pride because you need to save them. Your mother, your father, your grandparents, your cousins, all your family members, you need to save them first. That's the priority. Oh, I'm unemployed right now. It's embarrassing. It's okay. Just be bold and confident in that because you need to save. And this flesh and bone movement that we're doing, it's really one of a kind movement in this world. So within this atmosphere, you must really save your family line and make an effort to do that. And so really do it immediately, today. Call them and say, a team from my church will go. And I've seen that the team, the flesh and bone evangelism team, they go to a lot of rural areas as well. So I bless all Yewon believers in the name of the Lord to realistically experience the answer of this flesh and bone evangelism with spiritual urgency. This is the conclusion. So 
So a globally renowned writer Tolstoy, watching the helplessness of Russian Christianity, wrote as follows. He said, Christians pray for the transformation of the world. Not a few people are praying for the transformation of humanity, but I think not many people are praying for transformation of themselves. So he precisely saw the reason why Christians in Russia could not inflict spiritual influence and collapsed helplessly. He said, it must begin from ourselves. Do not dismiss the fact that transformation starts with ourselves. And the core method to do that have already been given to us. It is enjoying the spiritual mystery of the three concentrations, the three settings and three answers. And in the bulletin, we have all of this. We have the seven bodies and seven journeys and seven guideposts as well. You must continuously pray with that. And every week we will print it in the bulletin how you must hold on to this and pray. So really just pray with that. And the three concentrations is also about getting into the rhythm of morning, day, and night prayer. You wake up in the morning and you pray. During the day as you work, you pray. And at night before you go to sleep, you pray before our Father God. Amen. And the prayer that follows the seven bodies and seven journeys and seven guideposts. So pray that we'll be able to enjoy the triune God that, that is with me. And please give me the power of the throne that transcends time and space. Please give me the strength to be able to do the truth through seven evangelism movement. And so when you enjoy the mystery of the gospel, that field will become the platform and the watchtower. And the same is true for the church. When the light of Christ shines bright, then souls under darkness are bound to come find us. It's natural that this happens and unbelievers will come to us. And we will naturally serve the role of the antenna that makes spiritual communication. And so we recently had the event that was held in the Gangseo, by the Gangseo region. And so it was a chance for unbelievers to set foot inside of the church. And the people that hosted the event, they talked about the walk of faith at Jesus Christ. And I saw that a lot of people that attended were all very age, very old, but it's really important that they came to church. And so it is important to experience God and especially for the remnants to really see the spiritual mystery of three concentrations, the three settings and the three answers. And you must see how you change and how your field changes. And I really bless that you will become the witnesses of transformation in your lives. Let us pray. Living Father God, all of our believers have heard the gospel today. Let us be able to hold on to this gospel, realize that transformation is imperative and first become transformed ourselves. And let us all become the witnesses of transformation in our lives. And to the leaders of this nation, please give the answer of transformation to them. And all of our believers, including the remnants, please let them be able to be transformed and let them grow within the word that you give them. I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.